Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean, a popular resistance broadcast of hot news out of the region. In partnership with Black Alliance for Peace Haiti America's team, Code Pink, Common Frontiers, Council on Hemispheric Affairs, Friends of Latin America, Interreligious Task Force on Central America, Massachusetts Peace Action, and Task Force on the Americas, we broadcast Thursdays at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, right here on YouTube Live, including channels for The Convo Couch, Popular Resistance, and Code Pink. Post-broadcast recordings can be found at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Telegram, radindymedia.com, and now under podcasts at popularresistance.org. Today's episode, Alex Saab, Three Years a Kidnap Diplomat, and I'm happy uh, to have as our guest today, so many of you know her, especially those of you watching on the Convo Couch channel, uh, Fiorella Isabel. She has just returned uh, from Venezuela, where she attended a lawfare forum specifically focused on um, what has been happening with diplomat um, Alex Saab for the past three years. And for some of you in the audience, I will just, you may remember we have done uh, a couple uh, episodes regarding Alex Saab. I will post the links to those episodes in the program notes because they will give you some early background information on the case. But uh, before uh, I ask Fiorella to join the conversation, let me just give all of you a quick update and background before we start our conversation. So what I'm going to share with you is uh, is the introduction to an article written by our good friend Francisco Dominguez, and I want to share uh, his comments with you. Uh, as he says, this case is a terrifying example of the United States continuing commitment to illegal, unilateral intervention and regime change where no country is truly safe. On June 12, 2023, we celebrated or recognized the third anniversary of the illegal kidnapping and imprisonment by the United States of Alex Saab. Because the brutality and cruelty of the U.S. blockade was wreaking havoc on the economy and millions of the most vulnerable in Venezuela were being deliberately denied their human rights to the most basic necessities of daily life, President Nicolas Maduro tasked Saab with traveling around the world, procuring food, medicines, and fuel for his country, Venezuela. Breaking every treaty, protocol, law, and norm of international diplomacy, the United States plotted to have Alex Saab arrested while in transit to Iran to fulfill his diplomatic mission by pressing the Cape Verde government to illegally arrest him on June 12, 2020. The plane Saab was traveling on was denied refueling in Morocco and Senegal, thus being forced to land in Cape Verde. In his book, Never Give an Inch, published in 2023, Donald Trump's Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, admits as much, saying, quote, no other nation has the global reach to interrupt an Iran-Venezuela plot in real time and convince a small island nation to hold a wanted man. And then there's a, a full legal saga that, that uh, ensued after that, um, an extradition to the United States. Alex Saab is currently being held in, in a Miami prison. He has no access to health care. He is not allowed to see family. He is only allowed to see uh, legal counsel. And, uh, and it just goes on and on from there. It's a pretty heinous story. And it's a, and it's a hugely important story. Uh, regarding the extrajudicial reach of the United States. And so with that, I want to ask uh, Fiorella to join our conversation and share with us. You know, she was last week in Caracas for a lawfare forum, and this is such a, the Alex Saab case is, is, is significant lawfare. I mean, we've seen a lot of lawfare throughout the hemisphere in preventing candidates from running from office or removing them from office, but this is just um, a clear violation of international law, diplomatic law, and on and on and on. It's atrocious. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And I don't think it's gotten the attention on at, in, at the United States on the Western level that it deserves as a case of lawfare, which is why it was important that so many people came 
from different parts of the world, particularly Latin America and some of us from the United States of America, where we were able to come together to speak on different aspects. My panel was on media and how the media has contributed, of course, how they've been framing this um, this case against Alex, Alex Saab. They've been framing him as a, a criminal, as corrupt. This is, of course, classic as to how they did it. Uh, and I'll just start off by saying the 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 guests were all international and, and also national guests that were in Caracas. And uh, Dan, our, our karma, Dan was there, Dan Kovalik, and uh, he talked about it from a law perspective. And there were other lawyers and other people. There were activists who have been on the ground for the Free Alex Saab movement. And there were journalists as well as people who have been following the case throughout the its entire process. As Terry mentioned, she's covered this uh, before. This is a, now a, a case that has been ongoing for, I believe, is it, th is it two years? Um, three. He was arrested three. June 12th, 2020. Yeah. 2020. Yes. So three years yeah. now. Yes. So three years. I forget it. Yeah. So three 2023 now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. I forget you. <laughs> the last few years have been like, oh, just a blur. Um, <laughs> but yeah. So uh, unfortunately, three years since he hasn't seen his his uh, his children in the same as a free man. It's been, a, you know, time away from his spouse. He's a human being. And this is one of the things that I think a lot of uh, the 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 event was also wanting to point out, this isn't just a figure, this is a human being. But I do want to say that what was primarily discussed was the case of lawfare against Alex Saab. And what that is, is just using this idea that, it, that there is some sort of corruption associated with him to basically rid him out of any uh, judicial uh, fair process that somebody would normally have and to justify his detainment and that's putting it nicely i mean some people say he was kidnapped and i'm going to start off by talking about the fact that he was detained twice uh by first by donald trump and then by joe biden and i start off by talking about that because i do think it's important that that this is a case that is setting a precedent for how the united states acts as this arbiter of who is a valid diplomat, who is a valid president, who is a valid leader under these, this idea that they are the ones in charge and they are the ones that dictate the the sovereignty uh, of, of these nations. And so we've been seeing a lot of pushback against that, of course, in the, on the world stage when it comes to BRICS, when it comes to the new push for a multipolar world. We're seeing um, what's happening in Africa and the Middle East and the reemergence of cooperation between states that were once enemies like Saudi Arabia and Iran, Saudi Arabia and Syria. And in, of course, Latin America, we're seeing a push uh, away from the dollar and a push towards building, but in some countries and in some economies, something that is more in cooperative within the nations in South America and Central America. Of course, this is something that's going to be difficult. This is something that isn't just going to happen overnight. But we do recognize we've been seeing this push. Now, in terms of what that has to do with Alex Saab, well, the, uh, the Alex Saab case isn't just a persecution of a political dissident. It very much is. I mean, he, Alex Saab was at worst, I believe, at worst, somebody that was trying to provide food and medication to a sanctioned country. And if anybody, you know, Terry, you know what the, uh, uh, you have an, an understanding of what people went through in Venezuela um, and, and just going there and hearing the stories of people and friends that have been there and have survived these different decades and these different times of, that have been difficult in their own right, depending on the situation for Venezuela really tells you another picture as to how critical it was in the moments where Saab was trying to deliver these things and also oil where they almost ran out of petrol and Saab was instrumental. He is seen as a hero by the many people in, in Venezuela for fighting to basically get them needs. Now, the United States, of course, and the media have painted him as a, a corrupt individual, a, a political, uh, you know, a drug dealer of sorts, I've even heard as the 
of of Venezuela and the Maduro dictatorship. These are the things that have been said about Saab. They cover him as somebody that has done something wrong, when in reality, even if he had, um, he was a diplomat. And that's the thing here that that where the lawfare case comes in, because a diplomat by international law um, is is not supposed to be arrested. He was arrested with a diplomatic passport. He was a diplomat. And that brings me to the other facet of this is, again, that the United States not recognizing Maduro as president of Venezuela is the reason they're using to say Alex Saab was not a diplomat because uh, Maduro wasn't the president that the United States recognized. Therefore, Mm -hmm. the United States didn't recognize Saab as a diplomat so he could be arrested. And this is what we're talking about here. These are the same excuses. And this was pointed out. Of, of corruption, of, of, of whatever, whatever sort of stripping people of their credentials that has been used on uh, people like Christina Kirchner in Argentina. Uh, and you could talk about Pedro Castillo and how he has been imprisoned with no charges that have actually been applied against him. You could talk about also uh, what was mentioned is the um, the the case the 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 persecution of other dissidents in general i mentioned um julian assange in the united states how it wasn't really about him committing a crime against the united states because he was just a publisher but it was about what it exposed uh so it was a political persecution and that's that's kind of what is involved on in the lawfare case and that's kind of what we got to hear from various uh, people in various parts of the world. They also talked about regime change operations led by the United States and the West um, and how, you know, political um, dissidents, whether they be politicians or supporters, have been pushed out by uh, these, these uh, via these regime changes and interventions. I also mentioned how uh, the United States tried to decide that, you know, Juan Guaido was the leader of Venezuela uh, and then how Alexei Navalny was a potential opponent to Vladimir Putin because they simply decided it to be not because the people of these sovereign countries mm-hmm. decided it, but because they did. So all of these cases uh, really present this 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 uh, case of lawfare against Salad Saab in terms of the fact that he is merely a victim of the U.S. trying to create this precedent where not even a diplomat is safe if they are enough of a threat or perceived as some sort of threat to the State Department and the establishment. And that uh, really encompasses so many of us, uh, whether you're an activist, a, a civilian citizen, a dissident, whether you're a journalist or a political diplomat, you are no longer safe. So one of the things that was said there was if, if you know, we are all Alex Saab. This is something I've heard with Julian Assange. We are all these these dissidents that are being persecuted for political reasons and political manipulations. You know, what's really horrifying to me and 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 I think the case of Julian Assange and the threat of him being extradited to the United States he's an Australian citizen he's not a US citizen but he's the US is attempting to have him extradited to the United States and have him stand trial in the US and it was the same and Alex Saab the US did successfully um have him extradited to the United States he is Colombian Colombian with Venezuelan re- residency or uh, Colombian national or dual residency, but um, he was extradited and is now sitting in a U.S. prison in Miami. And so it's, I mean, you really see in both those cases and many others, but in those two specifically, because they're so high profile and the Alex sub not quite as high profile as Julian Assange, which we are attempting to lift his story here in this episode, but there, you know, the U.S. judicial system is has declared itself the world's judicial mm-hmm. system. Yeah, and that is just really horrifying. And so it doesn't matter if you're a U.S. citizen or not. You can still be found uh, guilty in a U.S. court <laughs> and brought it. Yeah, it's really... I don't think people in the global north really understand that. Maybe in the in in Europe they understand the Julian Assange case so clearly that way. 
But I don't think those of us in North America really get that ex what that extrajudicial reach is. The U.S. has determined itself to be not just the world's police with its military, but the world's court system as well. And on the background of that, Terry, I just want to say also there's been a rise in detentions of journalists. Uh, recently, journalist, uh, British journalist Vanessa Bealey was detained over her journalism on, on Syria and her journalism in general, which is completely in opposition, of course, to the BBC State Department. They've written countless smears of her. That one wasn't highly publicized, but she was detained for over six, five hours, six hours around um, and the UK can sanction uh, people. Uh, several of my colleagues were threatened with sanctions for working at RT as well. And of course, recently also Kit Clarenberg was another journalist that was detained for around the same time, five or six hours. So this, this is happening with journalists. And of course, I was also detained and questioned for about two hours. And so in the United States now, the United States right now, obviously is the one that is going after Julian Assange for for the for WikiLeaks and what he, that exposed but this this is now also we can talk about the FARA act because on on the background of all of this with Alex Saab the the Uhuru movement the Uhuru group they were just, a black can we just socialist explain to the audience FARA F A R A is foreign agent registration act so Correct. Sorry. The, <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're right. The Foreign Agent so Registration are. Act, if you haven't heard of it, it's it's basically so they they it's funny because they've criticized Russia for doing mm -hmm. something that was based on on the FARA Act, where if you are actually found to be a foreign agent, um and Nicaragua you, know, too. you will be questioned. And Nicaragua yeah, as well. And I don't Nicaragua know who else. Well. Uh, but um, but so what was what I was getting at is they have used the FARA Act to extend it, right? Because it wasn't it was supposed to be a foreign agent, like if you were working at the behest of another government as a foreign agent and providing information. Well, they've extended it to people who have merely spoken out against the established narrative. So the Uhuru movement, which was these a uh, black socialist that were speaking out against the war in Ukraine and speaking out against NATO's uh, accountability, NATO's role in that war, were uh, jailed recently. And they also had, um, one of the, the things that they had against them was that they were an organization and that they uh, had a Russian member that was a part of their organization. So that was used to tie them. There really wasn't any evidence of them actually receiving any sort of like direction from the Kremlin, any sort of, uh, you know, funds from the Kremlin in any way, shape or form. But that was used to jail them. And their case is right now is still, uh, you know, an ongoing case. And, and it's really difficult to look at that happening in the United States. That hasn't gotten that much attention either. Um, and, and of course we're talking about these people being arrested and detained for saying, I don't agree with this war. I think the United States is at fault. And, and then of course, you know, the, the intricacies of the case, um, I, I am going to have somebody on to talk about that because I do think it's important people know about this because this all, this is all complete. These are all different, but at the same time, they're all stemming from the, all the U.S., Hege uh, hegemonic role in uh, persecuting dissidents. And I think that is increasing in, in itself. And of course, we recently saw Tara Reid, a Biden accuser, uh, say that she does not feel safe in the United States. She was actually told by her lawyer not to return because, because she was going to testify against Joe Biden, that they were going to find a way to a arrest her. So she was advised not to return to the United States when she was in Russia. So this this is all happening all at the same time right now. And I'm just thinking to myself, you know, um, it's getting really dangerous to be truthful. It's getting really dangerous to say even what you think, even if you disagree. And this started, of course, a, a few years ago, but it's gotten increasingly worse with time. And Alex Saab is just another example. And it's seemingly an example that um that they've exploited because of his ties obviously to Venezuela and Maduro 
and the fact that he is a Venezuelan diplomat um, allows people to say, well, he's just this corrupt criminal that was, you know, working on the Maduro, on behalf of the Maduro dictatorship, and he shouldn't matter. And, you know, we're going to use all of these things against him to make sure that you don't think anything more of him. And the role of the media has been to portray that image of somebody that isn't a human being, somebody that that is just this figure. But it, it, in order to talk about um, Alex Saab, we have to talk about the torture he endured. He endured mm-hmm. torture of all kinds. While he, while he well, has and been still, in prison, I would argue he is still being tortured by by Absolutely. being denied medical care. Yes, he has yes. he has cancer and he's been denied. Yeah, so that is a form of torture t- too. And you know, and and yeah, I would, you know, it's just uh, yeah, it's really it's it's really horrifying to the point of being almost unbelievable. You know, I would ask you one of the, you know, this particular uh, diplomatic mission he was on when he was uh, grounded in Cape Verde and then uh, arrested by request of the United States. He was en route to Iran. And this is, you know, for the United States, he was perceived as a conduit between two heavily sanctioned um, countries, sanctioned by the United States, unilaterally sanctioned by the United States. And so they, he was perceived as a conduit for basically helping the Venezuelans principally, yep. but Iran too, you know, through the trade that he was conducting. And it's, uh, you, you can really see, as you mentioned, when you, and, and really understand, you don't have to agree with it, you don't have to like it, but it brings you a clear understanding why so much of the world is moving away from the West, the United States specifically, they have no choice. Their own, their survival depends on it. They cannot stay tied to the US dollar. It makes them you know, very vulnerable to economic sanctions. They can't stay tied for, you know, for purposes of trade, for banking, for any of that, even if they want to, even if their first choice would be to stay close to the United States, you can't any longer. For your own nation's sovereignty, survival, and the survival of its people, certain citizens. Yeah, and it's think, not ideological. Go ahead. As much as some of it isn't. No, wait. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It's it. It, it is beyond ideology in many mm-hmm. respects. Yeah, it's survival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that and that's what you know. I wanted to say it's it's not just you know like this idea that oh all of these you know countries are becoming super socialists and they're all going to take over and that sort of thing it's more of like economically it's just not feasible for them to continue this and i mean there is a there is some ideological sort of freedom behind it some some desire to have you, you know your sovereign identity your your sovereign right recognized and seeing and seeing the pushback now from Russia, from other countries, from China, from and then jumping on that and saying, okay, now we're not alone. We have these relationships that we can build on. But it's also it's also about where the world is going. And the United States is almost like it's trying to stay in, in one spot and everybody is running the other direction. And so they're going to cling on harder than ever because they don't want to lose this this their place in the world that they've had for a very long time and so the western world is is also in the same vein working in the same way with the united states i mean recently i don't know if you saw this you probably did but it was the south african delegation that was going to join president uh cyril ramaphosa in uh russia to meet uh, who uh, Cyril Ramaphosa was just also meeting, had just met with the Ukrainian president. He was Zelensky and he was going to meet with Putin and the delegation was supposed to join him and they stopped the plane. The uh, Polish authorities actually detained the plane. They, um, they, they had the plane there for over three days. I think it was like four days total or so or more. And they uh, frisked 
a diplomat, a woman who had a diplomatic passport as well, which was yet another violation. And the journalists that were there and the other members said this has never happened before, that this is absolutely unheard of, that they would treat a diplomat this way. But now that there's been so many uh, precedents set with which is violating international law when it comes to from the United States, well, then, you know, uh, other countries are going to continue following that example. And exactly. that group was never allowed to join President Ramaphosa. And so they were sent back. And this is again, this is just this is just an example of just where, you know, if you are perceived as a threat to whatever uh, the 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 establishment or the the powers that be, whatever you want to call it, the you know the West. Well, if you go up against wants, the narrative, <laughs> yeah, you go up against the you know what's you supposed could be to detained. be the established narrative, yeah, and and or, or worse, and like these, uh, you know, and uh, of course they weren't hurt, but they were. It was completely inconvenient to be in a plane and uh, for days and not be able to get out, and like, and the worst part was they were blamed. For it, they were. They said that oh, they, these people just wanted to sit here and and stay there. They they weren't being. They were told they just couldn't leave the area, not the airport. And so it was just this whole, uh, not the airplane. And so it was just this whole thing where it was like, no, we're not doing anything wrong. And this is it's the same attitude that we get when it comes to the U.S.'s persecution of dissidents, um, like Alex Saab and. Uh, Again, it's it's important for Venezuelans, and you got the the gist that it was so important for Venezuelans. Um, in spite of the fact that to many it may look like it's not that important because you know Venezuela is still facing high inflation, they're facing you know uh, the 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 consequences of having lived through sanctions, blockade, and 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 during the economic you know, ups and downs of this. This is not going to go away right away. This is a country that is still struggling. In spite of that, uh, people were very committed to supporting Alex Saab because they saw him as somebody that was trying to work for Venezuelans, that was trying to get uh, help Venezuelans. And so that that is that support he got uh, and the passion, the passion he got from a lot of people who see him as somebody that has been trying to help and 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 really, you know, really it it points out it emphasizes just how much the united states has gone after venezuela whether it's through interference anything. through regime change attempts anything and they've endured this time and time and again and so you can't help but look at the venezuelan people as being some of the strongest people for yeah, having really to endure are. that it's not easy at all yeah. no they are, they're incredibly strong and they're incredibly determined to maintain, you know, their nation and their national sovereignty. And they really understand yeah. what's happening from the North, you know, focused on them. They really understand it. You know, they're, they're followers of Simon Bolivar. They understand what's happening to the, you know, from the North. It's, uh, you know, one of the things you mentioned, Alex Saab helping them, he was arrested in June of 2020 on his way to Iran. And part of that mission was medical, not just food and uh, and other supplies, but medical supplies as well. June of 2020, the world was in, you know, a really strong pandemic mode and and very still very heavy lockdown in the United States. So this was even more significant that he was trying because of the U.S. sanctions, it's not possible for Venezuela to go out onto the international market and procure almost everything it needs, but particularly medicines. And so to be traveling to Iran in part on a medical mission and to be stopped, um, yeah, that, that's just, I mean, you can't really interpret that as any other way except the United States wanting to just kill these people, to see them die. I mean, they're, yeah. I mean, that's a really harsh thing to say, I know, but I don't, I think those of us who understand what sanctions are and how they're used, they are warfare. They're a silent form of warfare for many of us back in the States, out of sight, out of mind. You know, we, we say, you know, we're not dropping bombs on Venezuela. There's no boots on the ground in Venezuela, at least not yet. There have been attempts to put boots on the ground in Venezuela from Colombia um, in the past, in more recent years. But the sanctions are really a silent form of genocide, mm -hmm. a silent killer. 
And then it's yeah. an out of sight, out of mind thing, which makes them particularly insidious. And so to deny someone the ability to complete a medical mission in the midst of the COVID-19 global pandemic, I mean, that's, I don't think you can interpret that in any other way, except, you know, to kill people <laughs> or not you know, watch them die, I guess. It's maybe, I, I don't, I yeah. don't even know how to frame it. It's so ugly. Yeah, to use it to manipulate, to suffocate the population to the point of, of no return so they could turn against their, their government and and really just yeah. open up the, you know, the the dam into the United States coming in and and rescuing them or some sort of interventionist uh, or color well, they revolution. Would use the, uh, what do they call the right to the art? Uh, what's the, the human rights intervention? Mm hmm. Yeah. 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 To intervene right. on humanitarian yeah. for humanitarian. But uh, it is a form of yeah. suffocation. It's a form of, of torture because it is a slow death. And that that's what sanctions are. And you're right. People don't understand what sanctions are. Um, even and even people who have been living, you know, who are Latin American, who have been living in the United States and say, well, you know, Maduro and this and that. It's like, yeah, but you, you don't understand what you, you can't use. You can't you access your funds. The country can't access funds. The country can't import anything. The country can't like it. This, this is just you're completely frozen. And, you get, you know, you get small snippets of that it, as an American when you go to Russia and you can't use your your money and you can't, you know, buy things uh, where you may have money, but you don't have access to it. And you can't like function because of the sanctions. I mean, I got a small snippet of that. Imagine that times a thousand and, and living in a country and not having and then running out of anything and, and just having that desperation of needing to have food, needing to have water, needing to to continue, you know, living like a human being and, and being suffocated and told no. And and it is a form of it is a form of murder and it's a form of of complete and total disregard for actual human life and actual yeah, humanitarian yes. cause. So, yeah, yeah. It's like, we're going to make you suffer so hard and perhaps even die because we don't like your government. Right. Yeah. And so you either flee your country or, you know, are incur are being, you know, strangled to overthrow your government. And that, that's just, that hasn't happened in Venezuela and it's not going to happen. <laughs> it's, you know, it's not. not and, uh, and the world is really coming to understand this. I, yeah, and I, I hope with this conversation today with you that, you know, we we can help influence and educate uh, more of our, our of our citizens in in North America, the United States, in particular, to really understand what the use of economic sanctions is really about. It is warfare, and yeah. it is a form of warfare. There's no other way uh, to to frame it. And more in the and more and more of the world is is. Um, is recognizing that and responding to it. And so here we, again, see this multipolar world emerging, not always in many cases, because countries want to overtly disentangle themselves with the United States. But for many, the, there's no choice. Yeah, you just, yeah. It, it's, yeah, it's about nation, national sovereignty and survival of its people. And, um, you know, if we could just talk, I know you have um, more appointments. I <laughs> just so maybe if we could just in closing, Talk a little bit about uh, national sovereignty, because this with Alex Saab, as you mentioned earlier, he is in prison as a diplomat, as a Venezuelan diplomat. He was given Venezuelan diplomatic status at a time when the United States did not recognize Nicolas Maduro as the democratically elected president of Venezuela, even though the majority of Venezuelan citizens who participated in the election process in May of 2018, you know, said this is who we want. <laughs> and so, so that wasn't even recognized by, by the United States. You and I did a lot of um, election observation throughout the Americas between October of 2020, which was Bolivia, all the way through Brazil, uh, of 2022. And to me, and I think you would agree, the majority of 
people throughout Latin America and the Caribbean voted for those political candidates who supported national sovereignty, promoted natural resource sovereignty, and were proposing economic systems that would benefit the majority of the citizens. And that includes Venezuela. <laughs> and so, and that has been completely, I think, a huge frustration for the United States and perhaps, you know, even um, has made the United States even more aggressive towards many of these countries, which again, you know, could result in some, in a not very good outcome for Alex Saab. Yeah. I mean, national sovereignty is the number one thing that all of these countries want and have wanted for a long time. Countries like Honduras. Like for 500 Honduras, years. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, and, and well, that's a whole other show that yeah, like, it's yeah, almost sure. like we did it. You know, the, the, the Bol Bolivar situation, the, the, the freedom of, of from the, the, the crowd. Now it's turned into, well, what the freedom from the u.s because it's the same apparatus pretty much in power and yeah. so now we there there's that's still they're still fighting for that but um the 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 reality is all of these countries have wanted national sovereignty whether it was from the crown whether it's now from the united states or western hegemony and you know Honduras endured you know a narco di dictatorship basically for for over a decade and and you know and was able to come back uh, and, and free itself with with uh, obviously nobody saying that they're free of difficulty. Um, Nicaragua, you know, Cuba has maintained has gone. I mean, it's it's in really critical condition right now because of just the lack of petrol, the lack of 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 of, of tourism, the, the impact of COVID. But they've managed a sixty plus year blockade. And this isn't easy to do. And I think the American and Western public have no idea what that would even be like for a day. So yeah. they completely offset this issue of sanctions as well. Sanctions are bad, but at least this person doesn't want to nuke somebody. And I think right. I think that that understanding is extremely American exceptionalist. And we see this American exceptionalism brooding in, in the U.S. election. And Venezuela has an upcoming election as well. As does Mexico uh, next year, along with the United States, and um, you know other countries have it this year, um, and so it's important to really look at, at how the these countries elections will happen and how the United States is responding to them because I think the more these countries try to become independent and build relationships with each other and away from the United States, the more aggressive you will see. And I think right now the focus of the United States is clearly the Troika, Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela. And we, uh, you know, as anti-imperialists, have to do everything we can to uh, prevent our government in the United States because it's our government. It's where we're, we're citizens of. Um, where we can fully criticize and then fully, you know, go after to prevent the intervention in these countries, because it would be a detriment to the fight for national sovereignty of the people of the Americas. It would be a detriment for the fight against uh, imperialism and Western hegemony. So I, I think when it comes to national sovereignty, it is one of the most important things we can support of, of other people. And I think when people try to say, well, the United States, you know, you can't be proud of being an American. I think it has a completely different context to it. And a lot of people try to equate the two. It's, it's, it's one thing, you know, being a living in the empire and then being under the boot of the yeah. empire. So there, there's a difference. And I think it's up to, you know, journalists, dissidents, activists and and just people who you know do these delegations or who travel abroad to really bring light and that's why that forum was so important because so many different people had so many different stories as to why they were there and so many different organizations came together to really support Alex Saab and support the people of Venezuela and there was that sense of wow we're all here and we all see what is happening and, you know, we're going to try to draw more attention to this because it's not just an Alex Saab issue or a Venezuela issue. It is an issue against anybody who is against the established narrative, the established 
um, you know, talking points. And um, it, this is a fight for basically the ability for countries to make their own decisions. And if yeah. the United States doesn't recognize Maduro as the president is irrelevant because Venezuela has decided he's the president and it's that simple, you know, it's, it's really that simple. Sophia Rella, in our closing minutes, where can uh, the audience learn more about Alex Saab, the free Alex Saab campaign? Yeah, and, so it, 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 go ahead. And, and also, uh, and also uh, where can we find out more about the forum you attended last week? Yeah, so there is the uh, Free Alex Saab uh, movement, Free Alex Saab. I believe it was freealexsaab.com. Let me double check that. Um, and also, I will be posting a uh, a full uh, edit of my speech. The reason it's oh, it was in Spanish. It was in yeah. Spanish. So I just have to translate it into English, which won't be hard for me. But I, I, ha I had to do it in Spanish. So uh, I it was uh, filmed by the uh, Venezuela local Venezuelan channel and there was another YouTuber. So I will put that on Twitter and I will uh, also do the the written out English version on Substack for everybody to have it. So oh, that's, right. uh, okay. uh, yeah, so I will do that. But let me just make sure I give you the right uh, website for the free Alex Saab movement uh, because let's see, because that so one was really, that's you can find all kinds of information up until the latest, but there's the free Alex Saab movement in Venezuela. And then there's the free Alex Saab movement in the United States as well. Yes, it's freealexsaab.org is what free it is. Alex okay, I'll put that in the program notes as well. And um, also for the audience, I'll put uh, all of uh, Fiorella's social media handles um, in the program notes also so that you can uh, can follow her and uh, and see that great talk you gave last week in Caracas. It was really good. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm so happy you had time. I know you're just getting back to your work in your life in Moscow, and I'm just so thankful you had time um, to, you know, to talk to us today. It was really great. Always great to work with you, and I always so value, you know, what you have to say and share with us. So, Thank you very much, Terry, and I hope to see you soon on our next yeah. adventure. <laughs> yep. Next month. We'll talk about that. I'll talk, we can share that with the audience next week. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but anyway, I just want to remind all of you, you've been watching what the F is going on uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. We're a popular resistance broadcast. You can find us on YouTube live every uh, Thursday evening, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. Pacific. We broadcast simultaneously on the Convo Couch, Code Pink, and Popular Resistance. Post-broadcast recordings can be found at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcast. So thank you, everyone, and we'll uh, talk with you next week.